Hello, uh, good evening and welcome to what is our first Kendall Engineering Society and IET event of 2021. Um, I'd just like to say we're, we're indebted to the Kendall Engineering Society for organising tonight's speaker and also to the IET for providing the webinar platform and promoting the event. Um, shortly, I'll introduce you tonight's speaker, Len Squance from GE Healthcare, who will talk for approximately an hour. And this will be followed by a short Q&A session lasting about 30 minutes, hosted by my colleague, Bob Swindle from the Kendall Engineering Society. If you have any questions during the presentation, please pop them in under the Q&A section of your screen and Bob will pick them up at the end of the lens presentation. Um, so a short introduction to Len. Um, Len is a qualified radiographer with specialization in nuclear medicine and radio, radiographic reporting. He has held many positions at several teaching hospitals as well as being responsible for undergraduate and postgraduate lecturing at the University of Hertfordshire with external examiner positions at University of Bradford and the University of Salford in the past. Currently, Len is now the Mobility Manager for GC Healthcare covering the UK island for mo molecular imaging. So I'd like to hand you over to, to Len. Thanks, John. Thanks for um, trying to go through those. So I'll start sharing my screens that comes through and obviously allow it to go across. In terms of um, presenting the, um, the presentation tonight, then I'll run through the topics as they're going. But obviously, if there's any questions and things related to a specific area as I'm going, then I'm more than happy to try and take those um, as we go. So, Bob, I'm not sure if you're um, handling those and taking them through, but obviously I'm more than happy to um, try and literally expand on some of the points if there's anything that comes out on there. Um, so first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to come and present to you tonight. And I hope that it will be very informative and hopefully stir quite a bit of discussion and things as we're going through. So within my current role now, I actually work for GE Healthcare and they've actually provided a couple of the slides that I'll be using tonight. So some of the strange things that are going on here are literally purely because the uh, the legal team that we have within GE have ha really told me and asked me to keep the, the slides the same, but I'll point those out as we go across. The rest are actually quite generic and some of the slides are actually what I used to use in teaching as well. So. Primarily this evening, what I actually want to go through and try and cover with you and hopefully generate quite a bit of interest is really to try to go what nuclear medicine is when we're talking about this within imaging, because everybody's aware of really what we use with nuclear energy and that side of things. But when we talk about nuclear medicine, usually within a hospital environment, it can cause quite a bit of um, angst I would say was some of the patients that I come across but then there's a bit of concern and actually what's going on so I'll actually cover what that is then literally go through a little bit briefly about how it differs from other imaging within the hospital environment and then it's really moving on to what the actual technology is where it's standing currently and then move to the futures and we are actually internally where we're seeing some of the technology moving but also then within the hospital environment how it could affect you and things as well. So I'm aware some people might have had nuclear medicine imaging in the past, but one of the key things that we talk about here and what the differences are um, as well is trying to make um, a realization. So one of the first things I normally say when we talk about nuclear medicine is the key thing is we're actually providing the radioactivity that we're monitoring actually into the patients themselves. So rather than like with other imaging, we're actually making the patient radioactive. The reason for doing that is really what nuclear medicine is about. So as per the points on here, the first thing we're really trying to understand and review is the physiology of the body and how it is functioning. So the example I've got here, just as um, the image to the side, is really showing you the type of thing that's coming across. 
And anybody who's been to um, a hospital environment to actually have a nuclear medicine scan might have seen the strange scenario where they actually put up the actual um, placard at the front and the sign detailing where the department is. And they changed the N and the U around to make it unclear medicine because that's some of the situation we are in. And that's purely because we look at function. So this scan itself, if anybody wants to hazard a guess before I say it, and the main thing on here is really looking at the actual shape of it from the outline, but it's actually a brain scan. It's an old fashioned brain scan, but it's actually brain scan looking at how the brain was working. So the other key thing when we're looking at function and physiology of the body is we're not using x-rays. As I said, when we produce x-rays with the rest of the imaging, use it in CT and things as well, then we're actually making those as we're actually requiring them. So we bombard the target, it actually produces the x-rays, those go through the body, get picked up by a, a detector plate on the other side of the patient. And then once you've got your image, they're all stopped. We use gamma rays for actually imaging within nuclear medicine. So we actually normally get those from a situation where we can bombard an actual cyclotron target or use an accelerator. And then we use some method to actually produce a short half-life radiation isotope to then be labeled onto what we um, then pick up to be a pharmaceutical component. And that's where you'll hear the term about a radio pharmaceutical. It's the component of utilizing the gamma rays with the pharmaceutical and that pharmaceutical is where we actually will then be imaging. So in the case of a brain scan, we actually attach it to a HMPAO. And when we actually do some of the other areas for another example, we can use what we call MAG3, DMSA and other things. And I've got a slide on that shortly to show you some of the common ones that we pick up. But that's where the term, the actual radio pharmaceutical comes from. The most common actual radionuclide that we use, which is a radioactive component, is actually the technetium. OK, so I'll go through very shortly on the next slide just to show you where the technetium comes from. And this is a metastable compound. And that means in terms of what we're utilising with here, we're trying to make sure when it's decaying away with the short half-life, that it actually has a very short half-life. So we're not causing further radiation to the patient after we've actually finished the examination. There are instances where we want to have a longer lived isotope on there. So we can actually use gallium, for example, and some of the other isotopes out to do further investigation rather than just doing it on a single day. And the actual injections themselves normally come around and saying, OK, they're going to be intravenous. But we can use gases, not just liquids, to allow us to also inhale or even swallow the actual radioactive components and that will dictate again what we're actually looking at. So that means we can actually view the lungs for example or the stomach and things as well. So nuclear medicine the key thing to remember on here is we're really looking at physiology and function and not really trying to drill down on what the anatomy looks like. So that allows us to have a system where utilizing nuclear medicine we're really trying to pick up disease early because we can see physiological changes well in advance of any change to actual anatomy of the patient. <clears throat> when we move on to the, the technetium itself as it's coming through, as I said, we normally use cyclotrons specifically for PET imaging as well. And I'm not gonna go into detail tonight about PET, but just to make you aware, this is another component within nuclear medicine as well. And the overall arching molecular imaging side of things. But when we concentrate um, down to the lines of when we're trying to do nuclear medicine utilizing gamma cameras, then as I say, the predominant isotope that we use here is technetium 99M. That has a half-life of just over the six hours as we're going through, and it largely decays by a, um, the gamma ray coming out at 140 keV. So, in terms of when we're doing imaging and setup on the cameras, and I'll show you how some of the images are acquired shortly, it is really key that we try to differentiate exactly what energy we're using and setting up the camera to do the imaging itself. In terms of producing the technetium, we actually get that from what we call a molybdenum generator. And those are new, normally coming from a uranium source and coming across to provide that onto the actual stem itself. So in terms of the system, when we're looking on here, 
we've actually got a molybdenum um, tube that's set up, which is actually flushed through with saline. And then it's got a mechanism to actually filter out the material so we don't get any impurities. And that goes into a vial itself. And this will actually get the resultant technetium into a saline solution that we then can label with the, radio, the actual pharmaceutical part to make the radio pharmaceutical. So the common ones we use on here to give you the example are literally a phosphate compound using methylene diphosphonate or similar to image bone. And again, even though these images, and um, they're not the best because this is an early um, image that we've got off from, from here, they do look like a proper skeleton. That's if everything is working normally. When we're doing a review on here, you could actually see different things on here. So you notice on this example, the ribs aren't com completely symmetrical, okay? They can be different. And that's not necessarily down to anything sinister because we can pick up things like arthritis and everything else as well. So it's all it's indicating to us is there are bony changes occurring and the body is continually changing the bone and mapping it and moving it around as well as the other systems that we have within the body. So all we're doing is detecting that pickup. We can then use um, an actual macro aggregated albumin for lung imaging, where we're actually going across and that will show where the blood supply is going within the lungs themselves. And again, the amount we're injecting is actually quite small, but it actually will stick within some of the small capillaries to show us if we've got any blood clots for picking up things like pulmonary embolus, or if you need to have something like a lung volume reduction examination and procedure to remove some of the lung if you've got something like um, chronic obstructive airways disease and you need to get rid of some of those. Another type of um, thing that we actually have in terms of a pharmaceutical then are what we call DMSA and MAG3, which are both used for renal imaging. DMSA is normally looking at renal scarring. So if you have a lot of urinary infections, they want to know how well your kidneys are working. And the actual MAG3 scan is actually looking at what potentially might be causing those infections. So it'll actually cause the excretion that we actually do what we call a dynamic imaging. So we can actually see functioning in real time within the body. So as I'd mentioned before about some of the PET side of things and how it differs, but it's quite similar to nuclear medicine, I just wanted to point out very, very quickly a couple of things that are actually similar and then things that are also different within these with um, a small, um, literally an illustration coming through. So the actual image that we have here on the left hand side is showing you what we have for standard gamma rays utilizing standard nuclear medicine that will image on a gamma camera. So these will actually be emitted in all directions but there is only a single gamma ray coming from any decay event, okay? What we have on the PET side, which is on the right-hand side here, is the illustration of what we do with PET imaging. And this is positron emission tomography. So in that sense, we're actually looking at in terms of a ring detector where it's going round, but we actually have an annihilation event with this um, actual method of imaging. And the two photons are 180 degrees apart. So what we're able to do then is actually pick up exactly where that event might be coming by actually finding out where those 180 degree events are actually hitting a detector away from the patient and finding out then the difference in that time along that incidence will tell us exactly where that decay event happens. So that's one of the first things. The next one we have in terms of um, the system and things as well is the energy that we're using. So just to point out again that when we're actually injecting a patient, it's not like x-rays where we will actually target the radiation going through the patient. Because the patient is the one who is actually radioactive in this sense, then the radiation will be going everywhere. So for both nuclear medicine, SPECT imaging and PET, what we actually have is a situation where we only really record about 1% or less of the actual radiation events that are occurring. And that's why we have some problems with the actual image production um, side of things when we're actually managing to image the patients when they're coming into the department. So just bear that in mind as we're going through. The next significant difference between the two um, imaging techniques are that nuclear medicine is really going between the range of 120 
to up to 360 kilo electron, kilo electron volt um, range. Whereas within PET, we deal with the 511 keV photons. So the difference in energy is quite significant there, okay? The main thing to also bear in mind when we talk about nuclear medicine is because of how the body is situated and the tissues can actually attenuate photons, we need to make sure any of the energies that we're utilizing with the radionuclide part of the um, system is actually above 100 kilo electron volts. Otherwise, the body will actually attenuate those photons. We won't see anything either, okay? So the way we manipulate in nuclear medicine, what we're doing is how we've designed the cameras. And I'll come on to that shortly. So within nuclear medicine itself, what is the brief history about what we have within these systems? Well, this goes back quite a way that in 1896, we had Henry Becquerel who discovered these arrays from uranium um, that were being used, but he didn't know exactly what they were. And those were actually then described further by um, uh, Marie Curie when she came to um, present those and say exactly what they were doing. And they found at those times, you know, that led to the production of x-rays and things as well. But in terms of what we're doing with nuclear medicine here from what we got from uranium, it really led to a situation where nuclear medicine initially developed purely from a type of therapeutic point of view and not necessarily as an imaging adjunct. And this was where we actually saw the initial development and changes in 1925, where we actually had um, Bloomgart and um, Jens using the bismuth 214 to actually monitor the circulation within the arm to actually see transit times from one arm to the other. So they had a slight understanding about how circulation was going around the body and how long it would take. But as you probably know as well as I do, the bismuth 214 is actually very high um, energies in there. And it's not just a standard gamma emitter, which they're not necessarily just looking at. It has other things in there as well, which can cause problems. So what happened then is there's actually quite a long delay when we talk about medical imaging point of view. So we didn't get until 1940 where they started developing the first medical cyclotron. And the idea behind that is they could actually then produce the actual isotopes where they would use it for PET imaging and some of the actual radionuclides that we went through. But just bear in mind that the technetium that I've talked about in terms of the um, previous slides wasn't really developed and brought into certainly into any type of use until 1957. And it was beyond that point where it came into actually being utilized within normal industry to feed out to the other hospitals. But the major development from the imaging point of view for nuclear medicine really started in 1951. And that was when Kasson actually invented the rectilinear scanner. So the rectilinear scanner allowed us to actually monitor where radiation was within the body and then produce an image either by doing numbers or by actually putting down different grayscales onto the system to actually monitor what was actually happening. And it was actually then shortly after that well, where we actually had the HAL Anger develop the current scintillation camera that we have in still being utilized today in the analog systems. That wasn't actually officially registered and patented until 1958, but he was doing work on that in 1952 with some of the early research, just to make that clear. So if we actually look at where systems were back in 1951 and then going through, with the rectilinear scanner, um, as I said to you, the big main um, influence on this one was where we're actually looking at the photon fluence that was sampled within a small area. And that's because the detector size itself was obviously very, very small. Now this meant that actually in terms of imaging time for these patients, you were literally talking up to hours to try and acquire an image. And I'm not sure again, um, obviously I can't get feedback directly off here as we're going through, but the big thing um, as we're coming across is if anybody can identify what the image actually is at the bottom um, of that slide underneath the photo. So this is a rectilinear scanner. This is actually what's being um, imaged on here. If anybody's got any ideas. Um, the main thing as it's coming across is this is actually one of the first things that was imaged 
with a rectilinear scanner and it was predominantly what they were looking up um, even towards the end of its use. It was the main imaging system even into the 1960s and I must admit and I say I'm not that young anymore but I was actually using a rectilinear scanner when I first started my jobs and works when I was training as a radiographer um, and that was actually back in the 1990s before somebody says that um, you know I was back in the 1960s okay so that's actually um, quite pertinent but for those who um, have had a guess at what the image might be and then want to be put out of the misery for those who haven't been able to guess that's actually a thyroid gland so what we've got on here is actually the, the pole of the thyroid coming across down um, behind the neck, down into where we're going into the split and the other pole and the size of the lobe of the thyroid on the other side as well, and um, meeting in the middle as it's coming through. So we're actually showing here that we've got one side is actually slightly more active than the other, or we've got an underactive portion of the thyroid as we're seeing on here. But again, as I mentioned before, we've seen previous departments where they've changed the U and the N around and they've actually gone back to make it unclear medicine. And I think we can actually say that's an example of where we actually had unclear medicine as it's going through. But just to re-emphasize that again um, as another challenge. So if anybody wants to have a challenge home and keep score, this is where they're actually utilizing gallium citrate um, to look at a patient. I've told you there that we've actually got the left lung is being imaged. But again, it's not necessarily clear exactly what's going on. So in terms of reviewing this, um, you know there's a problem in the left lung. Very hard to make out exactly where the patient is and what's happening. So I'll put you again out of your misery. This is actually the head of the patient and this is the lower jaw coming in here. This is the patient's arm on the right hand side. This is their right lung. This is the mediastinum of the patient and this is their liver. And this is the left hand lung coming in here. And this part is the actual tumor that they're actually talking about. OK, so this is the cancer within the, the left lung of the um, patient that we're actually talking about. So, again, in terms of what we're doing, very hard to make out. And for those um, on here, normally I joke from a medical point of view and say when we're looking at this, this is comparable to what I see in ultrasound because I can't usually make those out either. OK, so rectilinear scanner. It was good that we could start doing this imaging. We can see how the body's working, but it's quite unclear and it takes quite a long time. So what Anger managed to do with his um, setup and his imaging was develop a large area detector. And what that meant was moving forwards once we overcame the problems with spatial resolution, which was a problem with some of his first designs, was to actually go through and produce images which were actually a lot quicker to actually image, looked a lot clearer, and then also were able to get the patient to um, have better prognosis and diagnosis from the images there. So this is an example of what we're looking at with the thyroid again within a, a given patient. So this is the right side, this is the left as we're going through, and this is the comparable image we had on the rectilinear scanner. So you can see the improvements in the image quality now, and the organ starts to look like it should do um, when it's actually got normal anatomy and normal physiology, okay? In order to get around the problem that we have for spatial resolution is where we've now got the current design and what Anger actually managed to develop back in 1952 to 58. So we haven't changed the actual mechanism we employ to do analog imaging even now. What this employed was the fact that at the bottom end, we've got the patient um, coming down here, and this is actually illustrating where the photons are all coming off. As you remember, I said they can come off in any direction and they'll come out from anywhere. So we don't want all the photons which are coming across an, at an angle because they'll actually degrade the image of the actual organ we're trying to look at. So to get around that, Anger actually came up with the idea of being able to use what we call the collimator. And this is also employed in x-rays as well. So we have what we call a Bucky mechanism. It's the same type of thing. The difference with nuclear medicine is we will change that collimator dependent on what type of isotope we're looking at. 
So if we're doing um, some of the higher end imaging, like with iodine one, two, three, for example, then we might have what we call a medium energy collimator, which has got longer sector, um, which is actually the length of the actual lead that we utilize on the system on here. So that's from this point to this point. And we also change the hole diameter on the system as well to let things through. What we have then on the system is actually a sodium iodide crystal. OK, so the sodium iodide crystal is actually what is going to cause the luminescence within there, which is going to produce the light from those incident gamma rays. So what we've got now is gamma rays coming in through the collimator, striking the crystal. The crystal will illuminate. That will then get picked up by the photomultiplier tubes. And these photomultiplier tubes will then uh, give a signal by amplification. And that will go through to give us a signal in both the X and Y and also a Z plane. And Z plane will actually give us the energy of those incident photons on the thing in order to say to the system whether it's being taken as part of the image or whether it's being excluded. The other thing that we had when we had the first type of gamma camera is a setup on here. And what we're demonstrating is the fact that the photomultiplier tubes sit within each of these holes. And the actual crystal section is this bit underneath here. So you see we've got a circular crystal and the PM tubes that we're utilizing have to go outside the area of the crystal in order that we can actually detect every single event. When we actually get an incident photon, they'll actually strike um, onto more than one photomultiplier tube, but the system will be able to detect exactly what's going on and assign any given um, value to a specific light event to a particular gamma ray. So it'll exclude any adjacent tubes picking up um, to make sure we're really accurate on the event. And this is important as we move forwards because it does mean that any photomultiplier tube can actually have a problem where if there's too much activity coming from a patient from a given area that we can overwhelm the actual detector itself. But the system will always work as we're going on here to show you that it will pick up the X and Y directions and the Z um, actual input is actually the energy of the pulse. So then it'll actually do with the single channel analyzer pick up the logic pulse to give you the instance to say whether that event happens or not. And that was typically then displayed on a cathode ray tube. So I just tried to illustrate a little bit more about how some of the collimators work, but also the impact of looking at imaging at different levels. And again, as we move forwards, the reason for showing you this one specifically is when we come to some of the SPECT imaging, and this is actually utilizing a detector which will rotate around the actual patient themselves, a similar way to what we actually do with proper computerized tomography on the x-ray side of things. So everybody hears of CT, well, we actually have a CT component within um, nuclear medicine and things as well. So here we're actually demonstrating that with a, a, sp a specific source, if you've actually got it so close to where the detector is that you're only letting through a certain amount of events, if you move that source away from the actual detector, then you'll see that down here, you're letting more of the actual incident photons traverse through the collimator and impact on your image. And you can see that the response is actually different, which will give you a different image quality at the outset, okay? In terms of the systems then um, moving through, because I'm aware of um, how I'm talking in times as well, what we managed to do was within nuclear medicine was develop an actual production system for the analog system here with the anger camera. And in 1963, we actually developed the first systems on the market, but they're actually a fixed detector. And it wasn't till 1982 that we were able to actually develop a spec detector where the actual detector moved around the patient as in this example on all of these systems, but we've got slightly different ways of doing it on each one of these as they're going through. What that meant was we we're able to move from a 2D imaging setup to able to produce a 3D image um, for these patients. And that enabled us to be more accurate in determining 
where within the body some of this activity might be occurring and where the problems were. So in terms of just going again through some of the differences about medical imaging, again, with nuclear medicine compared to some of the other techniques, just to make the point again that we're actually looking specifically at function, not anatomy, and that will become apparent as I go on to some of the example slides in just a, a second, but we're actually being more sensitive for the small changes. So you'll see that again as I come through some of the example images in a second. And then also the big real driver for us within nuclear medicine is we can always look at the contralateral side of a patient to make sure we've got comparison to see what a normal side is compared to the abnormal side, or if something is actually happening in both sides. The main reason that's a benefit is because even though we've got a very, very sensitive system for picking up changes within the body, the actual mechanism we've got to look at this means we don't know exactly what is causing that problem or that increase in the activity, or in some cases decreases. So it's not a very specific um, imaging methodology at all. So as I say, the scan times can be quite long. So we require multiple times sometimes to actually image these patients, again, depending on what you're looking at. So the example of where we're looking at for scan times will acquire some of the images for five minutes at a time, but we'll get the patient to actually come back numerous times over a visit. And this is an example of that. We're actually doing some of the imaging on this patient specifically. And this is actually um, a supine image of a patient being reviewed because they've actually had pain and persistent problems within their actual abdomen and they're not quite sure what's going on. So their pain was more specifically within the anterior right iliac fossa. So we actually undertake what we call a Meckel scan and that's where we can actually inject um, into the body itself and it will pick up any areas where you might have strange um, actual um, appearance of mucosa within the actual colon itself. So we're looking at the small bowel here. Sorry, I lost my mouse then, so it coming through. So what we're looking at particularly is the small bowel. So up here we have the stomach. Stomach's coming round and actually going through into the duodenum and then running through the rest um, of the ileum and everything else that's running through. And at the distal end of the ileum, you've actually got this increased uptake here. Um, within the, the actual patient themselves. And this is sat right within the right iliac fossa where the patient's complaining of pain. But as you notice, because it's actually, in this sense, a dynamic scan, and we're looking at how the activity is moving through the patient, we've done multiple scans as we go through from five minutes all the way to 30 minutes um, as we're doing the imaging. And then that correlated what, what they had on the x-ray when it was actually examined in more detail. So they took a plain film abdominal x-ray here. And again, they can then start detecting where the abnormality might be. So in this case, actually shows the fact that we've got um, the gas-filled bowel loops in the central abdomen, um, as you're picking up in here. But also then with um, some relative paucity of the bowel gas in the right um, iliac region, which is by that arrowhead to come through. So that's down here. So this is actually then able to correlate exactly with the uptake being shown in here. And this is where I'm saying the reason we actually now move to specs is we've done a sideways picture for the last image on here, but we weren't sure from front to back where this activity was actually occurring. So it actually shows on here that it's actually lying more anteriorly on this particular patient. But again, we don't have any of the other anatomic detail that um, requires to actually fully localize that. And that's why the X-ray was needed to do comparison. So just as another example on here as well, we actually did a, a bleed scan, as it's called, on this particular patient, where we actually take some of the red blood cells and actually label those with the radioactivity. And then we inject the um, red blood cells back into the patient. And then again, we monitored that over a period of time. And again, in terms of what we've done on here, you can see where the arrows are as we acquire that over a period of time. You can start to see where the actual uptake is going. Again, we've got a lateral image on here to try and show exactly where it's located. But that actually then equates to where we're actually seeing active bleed within this patient. Okay. 
Just as an illustration, though, moving on to um, another case here. Again, this looks comparative to what we did on the last scan as well. So this is another red blood cell scan. And this is actually from a patient who actually presented um, with a, a major problem where they thought they could be bleeding again within their um, bowel or small bowel, and they wanted to do a review. When we actually review this and compare to what we're doing with the last patient, you can see with the two arrows where this uptake might be occurring. But again, there's this large increase in activity as we're coming across here within the right um, iliac fossa area of this particular patient. And in terms of what we're expecting then, we'd be tempted to call that and say that was another bleed. But when we review that with actually undertaking an angiogram on this patient and doing a review, so they could actually then potentially go in and um, actually cauterize that area or potentially um, do some other type of resection, they found out um, as we're coming across, and you can see again, when we're actually looking at the, the arrow head and particularly this large arrow down here, illustrating where that uptake was seen on the um, nuclear medicine scan. This is actually showing the venous phase and these are actually varices and the varices are actually filling. So it's not actually an active bleed. So we still need the capability of having the anatomical data being shown to us and more information than we just get from the nuclear medicine scan. So this led really to some of the developments within the nuclear medicine environment to make sure we could get improvements within the system. First of all, to make sure we had an improvement on image quality, but secondly, so we could actually scan quicker. So we had the first dual headed gamma camera that was introduced in 1986, and that was then utilized by ADAC, which is now actually part of Philips Healthcare, where they managed to get the system and they changed the thickness of the sodium iodide crystal, which is actually laced with thallium, to make sure they could image these patients for some of the PET imaging with the 511 um, annihilation photons. But the major development with the dual headed gamma cameras meant we had a significant improvement on some of the actual image quality that we saw with these patients. So this is an example here where we've got the um, adult patient on the right, uh, sorry, on the left-hand side, you saying left and right's wrong then, on the left-hand side, showing you the uptake that's actually going on with the patient. And again, just for contralateral comparison, you can see here the right knee compared to the left knee, we've got more uptake in the right knee specifically, so we know something's going on. But again, also, because we've got more rapid acquisitions for these patients, because we can see more easily, on the patient where we've got it on the pediatric patient on the right hand side, this is the first scan that was undertaken um, on this one. And this is actually a, a, what we call a blood pool phase, and then followed up by a delayed imaging further on. And this now really en enables us to actually review the front of the patient anterior um, image and the back of the patient, the posterior image, both at the same time to become more specific about what uptake might be. And you can see there's actually significant uptake here within the right femur, and also there's some increased specific localized uptake within the um, proximal end of the femur here as well. And then on the delayed imaging, you can see significant uptake in things on here. So this is where pattern recognition comes into play. And I know from looking at this one specifically at the patient's age, and this is a two year old patient, that they actually have problems with um, mobilizing because they'd fractured their leg. And that's where this proximal femoral fracture is shown. And then this increased significant intense uptake within the rest of the femur um, across its length is actually then more indicative of a Ewing's tumor. So this is a Ewing's tumor that then can be treated for the patient. But this type of imaging wasn't really possible with a single headed camera previously because it would take too long to do. But then what we had with other patients as well is the capability really that we can now see more detail and localize that within the patient itself. So this is another bone scan and predominantly bone scan imaging is one of the key things that we do in nuclear medicine. It's that and some of the cardiac imaging, which I'll come on to shortly as well. 
But in here specifically, we had a patient who actually had lower back pain on the left hand side, as well as right hip pain. And they were actually querying whether there's actually any bony pathology that was actually related to that. So when we're actually doing the review on here, we've again got to compare one side to the other. And we do that all the way up and down the body as we're coming through. But then also we can actually then view individual slices. So if you imagine a CT scanner, this is the type of slices you get for that one. But again, here we're looking at the function of the body. So we've actually got a capability now of turning around and say they've got degenerative disease. But again, as I said to you, we can have increased uptake, which can show that it's actually degeneration. But here, there's no uptake being shown at all. And this is actually a pattern showing where they've actually had a hip replacement. So again, because it doesn't take up the radioactivity, we see it as nothing. So if a patient for some reason doesn't take up any activity at all, all we'll see on our image is nothing. It's not like we'd see on a standard X-ray or anything else. What we had then was uh, move towards doing some further imaging. So as we know, a body in its normal context is not uniform all the way through. So in this example here, we've actually got a uniform body. All the density across the entire length is the same, and it's actually almost circular and whatever. So any photon coming from um, anywhere within the body is not going to be stopped differently and what we call attenuated to a different level. Within the body, that's not true. You know, we've got these funny sticky out bits on the side that come down, which actually help us to hold things because that's our arms. And inside the body, we then got different um, densities sat within there, which are the lungs. We then got a funny thing that beats quite a lot and helps keep us alive called the heart. And then we got this high area that can stop a lot of the photons at the back, which keeps us upright called the spine. So all of these different levels and densities within the body causes problems for imaging because some of the photons could be stopped and other ones could, could progress through. So we get a different intensity across our imaging. So in 1999, and we do have to take credit for this through GE Healthcare, we managed to develop a system where we actually had a low dose CT scanner, which was actually set on the actual gantry for our normal nuclear medicine detectors. And what would happen is we do the nuclear medicine scan and then the patient would actually be having a CT scan directly afterwards within the same position. And we can actually then fuse that data. The benefit of that is when we're coming to review on a lot of given areas. So this is a, a literally a, a very quick example to show you that when we're actually doing the CT scans on these systems, they're actually very, very poor quality. But what it does mean is we've actually got true accuracy about what the uptake is within these lesions. OK, so it was not going to cause any problems. And this is actually a patient undertaking a par parathyroid scan. And here is a lesion sat within the mediastinum. And previously that would not have been detected. But because they use this actual scan here as a map and we can use the actual SPECT data on it as well, we can account for what would happen to the gamma rays as they traverse through the body. So if there's anything that's been stopped by some of the hard spine and things as it's going um, back behind the patient, then that can be accounted for and accredited. So it wouldn't have the 140 keV energy you'd expect from that gamma ray. It might have degraded down to 110 keV, for example. But because we've got this map here saying, well, there's actually a bone lying in the way and it's managed to attenuate that photon by 30 keV, then we still take it into account. So it means we've got a lot more accuracy in actually diagnosing those um, patients and picking up lesions. As I say, it actually came initially from the cardiac imaging. So the top image here is actually of the heart and we're looking at exactly what is going on. So if there's areas where there's not much uptake, we could actually say that's actually due to a potential heart attack or it's actually down to the fact that some of the coronary arteries are being occluded, when in reality, this could actually be a female patient and the breast tissue is actually stopping some of the photons um, from coming out at full energy and it's reducing their energy as they're going down. OK, so that's um, a key thing on there to make sure it's accurate. 
The other thing is an example here to show you the inverse effect of that. So this is actually without what we call the attenuation correction. And you can see the hot areas at the end of the um, ilium as it's coming through on here. And in this case, what's happening is these photons at the end are actually not being attenuated at all and coming straight out, whereas some of these other photons coming out from elsewhere within the pelvis and within the um, pelvic area are being attenuated. So it makes it look like it's actually hot at the ends of the ilium, when in actuality it's not. So when we then do a review, we see that this uptake area, which has been attenuated, now does become hot and is something of interest where the uptake at the ends of them actually have not of interest at all. So it allows us to differentiate that a lot easier. And again, we're actually looking at down here where we're doing um, some of the brain imaging. And this again allows us to characterize this. So this is actually looking at Parkinsonianism um, as well on these and trying to differentiate that disease out. And at the front of the skull, we've actually got some different changes on here, which looks like it could be increased background, which may indicate that person's got um, further advances from the Parkinsonianism based on what we're looking at from the chordates and things on here as well. But when we do attenuation correction, you can see that's amended and changed because of the skull vault itself. The other big development then when we actually implemented CT was the fact we can do what we call functional anatomical mapping. This means that when we're doing our actual nuclear medicine scan now, we can actually take the CT data that we've acquired for this attenuation map, but then fuse that with the data we've got for the CT scan. So now we can localize exactly where some of this uptake may actually be occurring. And it allows us to then be able to plan for imaging and also enables some of the other professionals to plan some of their treatment accordingly. So in this example, what we've actually got is a sentinel node scan. So we've injected a lady around in her breast and there'll actually be a nodule sat within here somewhere which they've detected. And then we actually allow that um, activity to be taken by the lymph glands and through the lymphatic system and see where that might be going and see if there's any other uptake of this activity. And in this case, it's actually tracked back and it's gone within the axilla of this patient. And we can also measure depth then within the patient itself to see where it's lying for this specific lymph node and then plan our surgery accordingly. So it means in terms of looking at a one-stop shop, we can do all our imaging now within the standard nuclear medicine department. We don't need to go out and do plain film x-ray. We don't need to have CT. We don't necessarily even have to have ultrasound when we're doing some of our prostatic imaging patients either. And from this scan, the surgeon would actually plan where the edge of the skin um, as for this particular patient, measure the depth down from where the actual skin is to where this actual lymph node is sat within the patient here and be able to resect that specific sentinel node from the patient without doing further invasive surgery. And certainly when in this example, when we've got patients who've actually had breast cancer and we're trying to pick up exactly where that might have spread, they've had to do radical resection previously, which has led to problems that they actually might have decreased motion within their arm, decreased mobility. They can also get lymphedema and further problems. Now attacking specific nodes, we can manage those patients more conservatively and there's a better prognosis all the way round. The other major benefit we see um, on scanning in things as well is a situation that we've got here as well. So we've actually had a patient who um, was originally came in with lung cancer and within the um, patient themselves, they started suffering from a bit more of lumbar spine pain and they're wondering exactly what's going on. So again, if we imagine the scenario where we're trying to turn around and say, we've got attenuation within the patient, you can see on this anterior image that there's something potentially showing down here, but it's very faint because those photons have had to travel through the rest of the abdomen in order to reach the actual detector so they can be masked. That's why with the dual head camera, we've got the capability of looking at the back of the patient at the same time. And then we can see where this actual lesion is actually occurring. 
And again, then we can actually go through and do the SPECT acquisition, which is where the detectors rotate around the patient. And we can actually see then on the um, actual main image where the actual activity is occurring, but we've got a cross-sectional image to know exactly where this uptake is within the actual body of the vertebra itself. And then we can correlate because we've done the CT for attenuation correction, we can actually correlate where this is localized within the spine as well, see what changes are going on, and that actually characterizes exactly what's going on here. So this is spondyloarthrosis of the right facet joint, and that's confirmed by what we've got down here on this fusion image itself. Okay, so we can then manage that patient accordingly. Just as another example, one of the key things we have, and again, going back to that unclear message, the major benefit that we have with this functional mapping is again, when we've got some of the high energy isotopes. So they become very noisy because of the fact that they can get through some of the large thicknesses of lead that we have on the high energy. And in this particular case, we've actually had a patient who's actually have a thyroid ablation because they've had thyroid cancer. And then they're actually able to pick up some of the ectopic um, areas that are coming in down here. So they can see there's still this ectopic um, actual lesion occurring, but I'm just trying to pick out here and say, okay, we can say roughly where the symphysis pubis is sat within this patient, because I know that this is where the bladder sat and this is actually urinary contamination. Um, I can see it actually down here, we've got the sending colon, transverse colon, so it's coming through down to sigmoid. So I know roughly where that's sat but I've got no idea then exactly where that's lying within the patient. So again, with the cross-sectional CT capability, we can fuse the image accurately, and we have less than two millimeters difference now between what we have on a standard system um, and what we, sorry, what we have on the nuclear medicine um, side of the, side of the system and the CT system. So we know this is accurately fusing to provide us an exact location. As we've moved forwards then, we've realized that there is an importance with the CT to not only be able to provide the attenuation correction and give us some type of imaging, but the latest systems now employ ca capabilities of doing diagnostic CT. And they're up to 32 slice capabilities. And this is now talking about sub-millimeter. So we're, we're at 0.32 millimeters thick slices for doing a lot of the orthopedic work and some of the in-depth work. The only real thing they cannot do is what we call cardiac angiography imaging and CT because of the fact that we still see the heart moving and it cannot do an acquisition quick enough to stop the heart motion that we can do on a standalone system. So now we've gone to that level with these gamma cameras and we've improved on some of the actual CT component, we're still using a lot of the technology that was really developed by Anger with his first camera. So we're talking about technology that goes back to 1952. So we're 70 years ago. So that something that we thought, well, you know, something needs to change there and be adapted. So this scanner that we've actually got in the, the bottom here is the one that was actually purchased to go into the Lancaster Royal Infirmary um, as it's going through. And they have a similar system here actually up in Carlisle, which matches this one. So they do have some of the latest um, technology there. But what we've developed is what we call resolution recovery. And this works specifically to map the collimator, map the actual um, generic setup of the detector itself in terms of response so that we can reduce the scan time for these patients. So in terms of getting them onto the scanner, our biggest enemy within nuclear medicine imaging is always time. The more time you spend trying to do the acquisition, the more chance there is that the patient's going to move and potentially blur the image. And that will actually lead to the fact that we cannot pick up the very early lesions that we want to try and tr actually treat for these patients. So with resolution recovery, what we have is a situation where we can actually map the collimator, map the response of the detector and reduce our scan time and the dose that's injected into the patient. So we're now looking at doing scans for these patients in only seven and a half minutes 
um, for a whole body bone, which actually compares to something when I first started back in nuclear medicine. And as you remember, it wasn't back in the 50s. It was actually um, later on than that. It was actually back in the, the 1990s. But even in 1993, we were still imaging for this um, centralized image here. This type of scan would actually take us 45 minutes. Now we're down to a factor where we can actually do this in seven and a half minutes and the actual quality has improved what we call the resolution to view these lesions. And the next step forward actually is where GE Healthcare has been developing is what we call Swiss scan. So this is a generic name, but what we're doing is again working with a collimator and then also working to actually map the noise within an image to know what's caused by what we call scatter. So it's actually just coming from any type of photon coming from anywhere in the patient, but not the area we're interested in. And then provide contrast enhancement and map and review this to provide us an image where we can actually scan a patient now in a time of less than five minutes. So that's where we're trying to get to on here. And this is actually our latest implementation where we started with these literally at the beginning of last year. So this is very new technology now, but it is now current. And we utilize that for SPECT imaging as well. And these um, going through mean that we can actually do a SPECT acquisition now within about five minutes to seven and a half minutes. So it means we're getting a lot more accuracy and doing reviews. The main driver that we want to take this forwards for when we're looking at current things is we're talking a lot more about theranostics. And theranostics is actually where we're looking at a patient, trying to do a review of what exactly is happening with their disease, then providing them with a treatment and then reviewing that treatment response. All of that is actually undertaken with the nuclear medicine department to make sure we can monitor how these patients respond. And ultimately we can either adapt their treatment or target it more specifically. And quantitation also extends into the context here as well, where we're trying to actually map rather than just doing imaging now to try and actually get a characterization from a pattern, we're also getting numbers and statistics out to be able to better map and manage the patient treatments through these phases. And that has led us to where we are really with some of the current technology and the capabilities of looking at some of these scans. And we're seeing some very, very early lesions down here as we're doing a review, but we've also got a capability then to actually segment and review these and see them in um, a spinning format, as you can see here. And again, we can actually then get a 3D map, and this will actually show you here with the green uptake where this lesion's actually lying. So again, in terms of enabling the actual referring physicians, whether that's a surgeon, um, oncologist, or whoever, we can now adapt and change their management and ultimately provide a better res um, response for the patients and a better experience through the imaging process itself. And that extends to all sorts of areas um, as we're going through on here. So this one is again showing you a capability where they got a very small foci within the neck. These were initially thought to be residual thyroids when they actually had a thyroid resection that was undertaken coming across on here. Um, however, it's actually able to show that it's more superior and therefore it must be a metastatic lesion. And again, the importance here is picking up from the CT images and specifically in this one and the actual cross section, you can see that is now lot actually lying within the vertebra itself. So because it's a bony lesion, it has to be an actual metastatic disease rather than residual thyroid tissue that's been left behind or has actually been um, excreted up into that area. So again, we can manage that patient significantly better. And I've just got um, several other images on here just to give you some examples where we're actually picking up and being more specific on targeting. And again, just to point out the benefits of doing contralateral imaging on this patient. Um, but when we actually talk about where we're going further moving forwards, it's key that you look at what we've got in terms of image quality here. And um, this is a 
really trying to pick you up for a prime example within the body. So look at the spine itself, look at the ribs, but also look at the noise in the background. So what we're looking at the soft tissue, we're not interested in that, but we still see it because there's still some uptake. So we'd like to improve on it all. So that's moving to me really towards where we are with new developments in the actual nuclear medicine field and how we see things. So we actually developed CZT, which is cadmium zinc telluride imaging back in 2009. And we did this for the cardiac um, imaging initially because it was very small detectors. And that's based on the cost that it was to actually produce these. However, G Healthcare introduced a general purpose camera back in 2016. So again, when you look at the images I showed you previously about where we were, the technology, we still got the CT component on the back of the actual gamma camera itself, but these detectors now have changed. So rather than the sodium iodide crystal that we had previously, we've now got cadmium zinc telluride. And because that is solid state and a direct conversion, we've now got a capability to really slim down the system, but really drive improvements for imaging. So this is just to try and show you the detector blocks. They actually sit within the, the head themselves. Each one of these modules in here, the block, this is the one that's been taken out from here. You can see expanded. This is the module itself where we're actually looking at the um, crystal down here, the cadmium zinc telluride with the pixels up behind with the capability to do direct conversion and then the electronics to send through. They are very, very compact. And if you compare that to what we've got with our current anger camera, um, I've given you two examples. So this is the GE illustration about how things sit at the moment. But you'll notice this is actually the PM tube from that camera that I talked about was actually in Lancaster. They look like this. And this is the new CZT modules, significantly smaller. So all of this work, including the collimator, is actually a very, very large detector size. Now we've managed to shrink that down significantly um, to be able to give us an improvement. And really the main improvement here is in terms of resolution. And I apologize for all the um, information on the uh, left-hand side of the slide here, but I've had to keep these specifically as they are, as we have them as marketing material, because I was requested to do that by GE. But the key takeaway from this one is the fact that these pixels are 2.46 millimeters. The resolution that we actually have on a standard gamma camera with the anger detectors is only at best 4.3 millimeters. And on some of those, they actually even go higher and they're actually over five millimeters. So we can see lesions a lot sooner now. And again, for the capability of the detector, one of the other key factors on here is where we've got the response of the crystal itself. So what we talk about count rates, you remember, as I said before, some of the images were very, very dense because of the amount of activity that's being detected. This detector does not get saturated. The PM tubes fail in the anger camera and it has to drop off. It can only get to a certain point. So the more activity will not lead to a better image. With the, the CZT detectors, any increase in the actual um, activity being produced from any given area does not affect the actual CZT crystals themselves. And we also get a better response here in terms of energy resolution on the system. So the light blue is actually the energy spectra for the actual sodium iodide crystal. And we've got here technetium window being utilized at 140. And we've also got an iodine 123 window at 159. And these are very, very close together. And the actual sodium iodide system cannot resolve these two peaks as separate points. It doesn't have that capability. Because with the capability with zinc, uh, sorry, cadmium zinc telluride, we actually have the two peaks being differentiated significantly. So it enables us to actually do what we call dual isotope imaging. So again, we can employ that not just in the cardiac imaging as per the image here on the right, where both images are acquired together, but it gives us a range of imaging capabilities, even with things like within the brain. And the key differentiator here is that with the actual new um, CZT um, system setup, 
we're moving towards what we call theranostics imaging, which I discussed with you previously. But we've actually got a gallium PET image here, which was acquired where you can actually see all this increased uptake within the spine here, which is then shown within the, the functional anatomical um, image coming across the center. These are actually metastatic sites, which actually cause part of the um, prostate cancer within this patient. When they've then done the imaging um, follow-up, they've actually decided they can actually treat this with that lutetium into the patient, and that will actually be taken up by the tumor sites. And because of the um, cadmium zinc telluride, we can actually then image that uptake within the patient and see the response of all these metastatic lesions within the patient. Because even though here you'll see the resolution is not fantastic, and it is improved on the spinning image here and actually better on the, um, the rest of the transaxial images, it does mean we can actually visualize something that we could not visualize before. And I just had a couple of images here to show you as a comparison. Um, when we actually look at this patient specifically and review what we've got, this is actually quite a difficult patient anyway, it's quite immobile, so the uptake was quite poor anyway, but the actual resolution to see on the um, patient here on the cadmium zinc telluride system compared what we have on the sodium iodide, you can see this image looks a lot clearer. So this has a lot less noise within the image and the resolution is also improved. And again, on the posterior images, you can see that is actually true and effective because this sodium iodide image, the spine is actually quite ill-defined, but on the cadmium zinc telluride, it's actually quite clear. I just had several examples of this where it's coming through, even to the points where we're coming across on these patients where the actual sodium iodide uptake, this looks a fairly normal scan on this patient comparing like for like as it's going through. But on the CZT, cadmium zinc telluride, you can see that there's actually a lesion coming across here within the cervical spine. And when you drill that down with the um, CT capability and things as well, you can see how that fits with the actual lesion as it's coming across on the CT image. And you can actually see the uptake and um, correlation as well. So again, we get a lot better response with the um, CZT systems and it's picking up disease earlier. And this is just another example um, with multiple patients just to show you it's not a one-off setting. So again, here, looking at the sodium iodide image, not necessarily much to visualize, on the cadmium zinc telluride, we start to see lesions are actually being imparted and things on here. And again, when we actually link those and do a review, we can see where this uptake might be occurring. And then we can characterize the disease with the um, fusion images that are going forwards. So again, CZT is leading us to another generation of imaging where we're able to do a lot earlier disease detection and do a review but it's still utilizing the similar principles for utilizing a dual headed camera. So moving towards the future, what we now have been developed is actually a system for 3D imaging. And on here, we've actually got um, a system where we've got these fingers within the system. These will actually extend out. And at the end of these fingers within this um, particular component, you will actually have a solid state detector and um, CZT based to do the imaging. And they can actually come in very close to the patient and allow you to do the review and provide you imaging. So just as a, a quick review, these are the actual ends of those fingers that you saw. And these detectors can actually move within those fingers to actually enable you to actually do a review of any particular area. And it will give you a really, really precise, definitive, high resolution cross-sectional area of the organ you're looking at. The downside to the system, because these actual detectors can move within the system, to get the optimal um, sensitivity of the CZT that we have on the general purpose camera, they have to be directed at a particular organ that you've got of interest. If you try to get them and open up the collimation to take an entire area, then you actually have a problem where some of the actual sensitivity can fall off. So you lose some of the benefits you had that, um, from that actual general purpose CZT system I showed you previously. 
but it does mean we're moving towards quantitative imaging. So we're actually trying to measure what the lesions are that we're detecting and actually changing our management of these patients ultimately to make sure that if we see a disease, we can characterize how active it is. And this is then specifically in this case for a metastatic lesion from a cancer, then we can actually treat that and see how it responds to what we're doing, whether that's chemotherapy, radiotherapy, or even as we had before, the radionuclide therapy, where we had it with that prostatic patient specifically. So we're trying to now gauge, not just from um, previous positions where we started in nuclear medicine, looking at providing some treatment by putting a source close to a patient and then seeing what happened. And it was very, very high dose, so it damaged tissues. Going forward to actually starting some of the basic imaging, then we've gone through to make sure we can map and actually um, correct for the attenuation of the rays within the body by doing some of the CT input, utilizing that CT then to do a diagnostic CT to provide us with a fusion imaging. So where we are now, we're actually developing systems where we've got the latest capability of detecting very, very small changes in the body, characterizing those changes, and then also monitoring those changes in the body, how they actually are being affected by the actual treatment we're giving. OK, so in terms of time, I'm aware I've gone slightly over, but that was really trying to give you a rough overview about where we are with nuclear medicine, how it drives to where we are today, and also a brief insight there to where we're seeing the future as it goes further forwards. So thank you for your time. and I'll hand over to um, John again, just in case we've got any questions, either or Bob. Oh, OK. Thanks very much, Len. Um, Bob, are you going to field the questions? Yes, I am. Do you want to see me? Does that help? <laughs> well, <laughs> it doesn't matter. We can see Len answering them, I suppose. OK, Len. Um, <laughs> there's been a number of questions on, is this thing being recorded? Uh, can we have the slides, etc. I'll let uh, Len, uh, I'll let um, John and Fred pick those ones up. But I've got a question related to the radioactive material that you're using here. Who makes it? Where does it come from? How do you secure it, transport? How do you dispose of it? Right. Um, so that's quite a lot of answers, to be honest, um, as they're coming through. So we actually have a network set up for doing a lot of these. So if I just specifically talk about the actual gamma camera side of things because on the pet side it's actually slightly more complicated and the reason it's complicated is because some hospitals have their own psychotrons so when we talk about production and actual imaging and then going through to disposal they're actually handled within the hospital rather than the larger environment so it gets a little bit more in depth but when we talk about the gamma camera side literally all the radioactivity that's actually used is utilized normally from a production within the main manufacturers. So G Healthcare have a facility where we can actually produce this. Um, this is actually from Amersham originally. G actually acquired Amersham um, as a company some time ago. And Amersham were one of the first companies to actually develop some of the um, technetium products and also some of the other gallium citrate and things as well. So what happens is the companies there, ourselves, we have some with Siemens as well, which Siemens have actually got a production arm. They will actually produce a lot of the activity. Now, the, it differs depending on exactly what you're looking at. For the technetium products, we have the molybdenum generators. Uh, I probably didn't dwell on that one enough, but we actually provide the generators which contain the molybdenum source within them. And you just elute that. And because these generators with the molybdenum, the molybdenum has a significantly longer half-life. And it just so happens to actually correlate that you can actually get um, the review of that material from one day to the next. So when we talk about the half-life of the molybdenum, we will actually elute that as it's called each day by utilizing the saline, putting that across. And then we will label the actual technetium normally at the hospital site. So they'll have their own little radio pharmacy set up where they can actually 
loot the molybdenum generator, get the technetium out, and then put the pharmaceutical they intend to use to inject, inhale, or actual um, utilize by other means by swallowing or something with the patient, they'll actually do that on the site. Because of the fact that technetium actually has a, a really, really short half-life, so it's six hours, which makes it an ideal actual imaging agent. And that's because, again, it's really just the gamma emitter. It doesn't have any damaging alpha or beta rays coming out of there. Then the patient themselves will actually just excrete the normal waste of the technetium, whichever um, pharmaceutical is actually being tagged onto over a period of time, or it will just decay away again over a day or two. OK, so there's no need to worry about how we dispose of that activity. However, saying that some of the other ones we are talking about, like iodine, um, even some of the gallium and things like that, it's longer lived. So we have to make sure with those they are utilized and transported in. Again, you might see some of these vans on the motorways and things like that at times. They've got a radiation symbol on the back. They're usually something like the combo vans and things. They will actually come from a, a standard center. We have quite a large setup in the Netherlands for some of the stuff that we utilize within G Healthcare. There is actually some facilities in Sheffield and things as well. So the iodine one, two, three, specifically the I131, because that's a very long live isotope, um, the gallium inside of things, they will be labeled prior to being delivered to the actual hospital site. They then have to be accounted for, and we have what we call radiation holding licenses, and you can only have certain amounts of that activity going through. They are then injected into the patient, and you monitor what the activity was that was delivered, and you've got a, a various certificates and things going through you monitor what you inject into the patient and then what you have to dispose of, you will normally keep within your department and you've normally got a, what we call a radiation store. They'll put that away and it will actually be held there until that waste is actually decayed. The rest that's injected into the patient, we'll just be able to monitor. And because they're utilized normally in a sense that it's just one patient out of lots of different people and there's only probably one within the household, we don't normally have to worry about them either. They'll excrete the excess out or it'll come out of the body one way or the other. And again, they're relatively short lived. The exception to that rule is the iodine 131 because we utilize that to actually cause ablation of the thyroid tissue in these cancer patients, as well as imaging that on the gamma cameras. So that is quite high activity. And again, this can be quite weird. So it's actually delivered again by a transport mechanism. So they're produced by the actual industry out in the field at the relevant um, site, which is usually a large psychotron facility and things as well. When they've got those, normally it's a capsule for the therapy patients. They have specific capsules they're actually imaging. Again, they're tagged for the amount of activity. They'll then bring that to hospital site. It'll be all recorded. They've got the holding licenses again. They'll get the patient to swallow that. But because of the fact of the excretion methods with the iodine and it's such high activity, they'll make sure usually that they've actually got a specific bay within the hospital to normally account for these patients of some of the high activity and they'll be isolated. So because it can come out in the sweat and things like that, then they'll actually get all the bedding that the patient's been utilizing day to day and they'll actually store the bedding within the radio pharmacy store downstairs. So it's quite an in-depth procedure when we're doing iodine 131 ablation therapy and imaging um, that we don't really have for elsewhere. Those patients also, when they get to a level where they can actually go out into the community again and run through, they're not necessarily able to travel easily either because of the fact that mm. the level of activity that's coming off from the thyroid can set off the metal detectors in an airport. So we usually have to give them letters and things as well. So you, if you're lucky, you might come across a patient where they're trying to hand one of those over as they're going abroad. And the reason I say I'm lucky is because at the moment we know we're not traveling anywhere with COVID, <laughs> but it's another thing that actually happens. So it does depend on the isotope, but there are various mechanisms in place to handle those. But the majority with technetium imaging, which is really about 95% of the isotopes we're using um, commonly in nuclear medicine imaging, most of those we just worry about them being excreted away. Um, I won't go into depth because we, when I used to run the department in Leeds, I used to have to go all the time with environment agency 
because you've got to get designated toilets and things like that as well in the department and monitor how much is going down the sewage system and whatever. That's only in the hospital, not for the patients themselves, because obviously there's a higher concentration in the departments. We actually have what we call designated toilets. Okay. None of it goes to Sellafield then, uh, Len? No, no, we're, we're not quite that <laughs> high activity, thankfully, but it does have to be stored a little while. Yeah, so, and it is monitored. <laughs> A question, an anonymous person, um, how do you ensure the radiation emitted from the source doesn't harm the tissue that you're examining and all the surrounding tissues in the patient? Right, the easy answer is we can't. Um, so the reality when we're going through a lot of these is we actually do assessments. So I tried not to cover it in too much detail, but one of the main things we're now doing is with the radiotherapy um, treatments that we're actually giving um, with these patients and specifically the radionuclide ones. I showed you the, the case where we actually had the lutetium imaging and we can also do what we call cert spheres and things as well for some of the um, liver lesions that you can actually occur. What we do there is with that quantitation I was showing you at the end, we now employ that on a regular basis for anything where we're doing radionuclide therapies to see what the impact is on surrounding tissues because we obviously cannot guard anywhere on there. The only main thing to actually point out on here is most of these therapy um, systems that have been employed are actually decaying by means of beta emission. Um, we used to have some alpha emitters and things as well. And as you um, might appreciate, alpha rays actually travel very, very small distances, but are very, very damaging. Beta rays travel a bit further and can be um, damaging to different areas. And then it's the gamma rays, which can actually travel quite a long distance and don't really do a significant damage to um, any tissues unless they're in a really significant amount. So when we're looking at the beta rays, no, we're not actually being able to protect a lot of the um, surrounding tissue. We can actually map that um, when we're doing the imaging and see what the impact is. But again, because a lot of them are actually then beta emitters, they won't travel that far in the body either. So it's not like we inject and um, we image where we've done it with the bone scans and things there. They'll actually only go to a smaller area. But we do try to minimise that as much as we can by making sure that whatever we're trying to treat will take up that activity for the treatments. OK. OK, another anonymous one, Len. Um, is nuclear medicine imaging cheaper than, say, MRI te uh, techniques? And, in, and what scenarios and criteria would you use to choose one versus the other? Right. Again, this isn't a straightforward answer, unfortunately. That's like everything in nuclear medicine. The answer is for things like bone scan imaging and trying to pick up on um, that one specifically again. And even when we're talking about myocardial imaging, which is looking at the heart um, and seeing viability, that tends to be cheaper than a lot of the other imaging, specifically MRI, because it can be more expensive. But even when we look at CT, it's actually less expense um, on the nuclear medicine side as well, purely because when we're actually producing the isotopes, um, we produce them in um, a significant bulk amount and they're actually the component parts are quite cheap. The actual cameras and things like that as well, then when we're actually working and utilizing those, because we do not use radiation within those systems, they actually have a greater longevity of um, lifespan. So most of the gamma cameras we talk about, even with the CT tubes in them and things as well, have a lifespan of about 10 to 15 years. Where you look at MRI and you look at CT, the cost of an examination is obviously part of the um, equipment costs and things as well. It's not just the standard imaging. Those actually only really have a lifespan of about seven years. So we're about right. twice the time and also about half the cost of some of those systems. So overall, those tend to be cheaper. However, saying that, if we go back to that lutetium imaging and some of the um, iodine therapy treatments and things as well, which we can then image, they can actually be quite expensive. OK, so that's really because of the fact of the availability and the cost to actually produce those isotopes can be quite high. Um, that's right. going across there. The main reasons for choosing a specific type of modality again is really dependent on what you're trying to see. And we have gold standards for different um, imaging ways. And normally it's trying to rule things out. 
the reality is normally you have more than one imaging method for doing different things. So trying to pick up on the key areas again, the main imaging work we do in nuclear medicine with the bone scan first, then we used to have a, a normal workup process. So normally there, when we're looking at things like um, prostate cancer or breast cancer, you'd normally have a diagnosis by doing something like a mammogram for the breast and they'll be doing ultrasound and things for the prostate to pick up whether something is actually present first. Once they've got a diagnosis with biopsy and other reviews that, that is probably cancerous, then you'll go to nuclear medicine secondary because you want to see if the disease has spread and gone elsewhere. The other major consideration then when we're looking at things is because we're looking at physiology of the body with nuclear medicine, we can see how the body is changing based on the treatment that's being given. So once you've done a radiotherapy and chemotherapy of a patient, it's very hard to look at the MRI and CT because you actually cause a lot of the lymphatic system changes and on CT and MR, you're not sure if that's because of the facts of disease progression or because of the treatment you've given. So again, um, we can monitor disease a lot easier with nuclear medicine than you can with some of the other um, procedures. Okay. okay, that's interesting. Um, a, a comment rather than a question from John Jacobs. He was a technician at the Northwick Park Hospital in, oh, wow. 19, in 1980. And 1980. he was used as a, no, a normal subject for one of the first gamma cameras. Well, that's quite handy because my previous role was actually at Northwick Park and my first job in 1993 was down at Northwick Park. So I think what he's talking about is the Syntronics gamma camera that was actually at the end of the department. And it was actually literally almost completely glass all the way around in there. So it used to be really cold in winter and really hot in the summer. And that can actually cause us problems with some of the gamma cameras. You can actually crack the crystal because they can actually have those stress and changes. So it's handy to know that that's out there, but it's strange that we've both migrated north and now living north of things, having started down in the London, being at Northwick Park and down there in Harrow. <laughs> so well, let's let's hope John, yeah. on the basis he was a, he was a, a guinea pig, doesn't glow in the dark. No. <laughs> um, uh, uh, we have to have a Brexit question. Sorry, Kenneth Harden okay. says, has the availability of isotopes been affected by Brexit? So the reality is no, but that is really because of the things that have been put in place before we went through the, the dreaded B word. So we've made sure that in order to get most of these coming through, we normally fly a lot of these things because of the fact that we're talking about half-lives that are quite low. And again, that's beneficial for us because it means that um, the patients themselves don't have a lot of activity staying around for a long time. But again, all the mechanism to get all the authorizations, all the um, required documentation and everything together, then we're not being affected um, on the whole. Saying that, um, you know, things could change and go through, but literally I'm not aware of any of the main companies who provide um, radioisotopes, even um, uh, curium and things do not have an issue. We've made sure we've taken account of that before it actually came into play. And that's a, a major thing. I mean, it's a, it is a valid point. Because if we did have those problems, then medical imaging that would then be suffering accordingly. So, you know, thankfully you haven't suffered. Um, a question from Mike Foy, which is about how much of the of the gains that you're getting in this um, technology is coming from image processing software rather than from in improvements in the detectors and the cameras. That's a very interesting question. And um, in reality, it is a combination of the two. So we talked about the resolution recovery and I talked about the Swift scan, um, so which is actually the trademark name for what we're doing with the latest um, technology. All of that mapping is actually software driven. And again, we looked at iterative reconstruction coming across on CT as well. So I didn't mention that. But again, that is software driven. Um, and we're actually utilizing a lot more of artificial intelligence to build the maps and actually do the um, inherent learning to improve the images further as we progress as well. So the reality is there's quite a significant amount of technology improvement within the equipment. But again, we're taking a lot of use of the software and things as well and the processing capabilities to also aid us to um, do the improvements. So at the moment, I have to say it's equipment with the CZT technology, then that was a big step. So the equipment is a major factor, but about 25% of what we're doing in, on the gain side of things is down to the software um, as well. 
So is there a lot of interpretation required on these images? And so how, how do you train the people in the hospitals to look at them and make the deductions that you can? Yeah. So again, I mean, I, I spent a whole um, six months doing this and things that are um, some work when I was doing some of my um, MSc work. But the easy answer is a lot of it is actually pa pattern recognition to start with. Um, as you're going through. So you'll notice that a lot of the diseases will follow certain things. But on that example I gave you where we're looking at the bleed scans, it is also critical that we look at the different imaging. So on that question we had earlier about which type of imaging would you choose one against the other, it's not usually a case that you pick one imaging modality and use that in isolation. You use them across the board. So even if you're doing a CT scan, you might well follow up with ultrasound, nuclear medicine, and even MRI as well. So it's a case of reviewing all of the data you've got to come to a conclusion um, and do that review. But th the reality is a lot of it is pattern recognition, but that doesn't really characterize you down. As I said, we're very sensitive in nuclear medicine, but the specificity to be able to decide exactly what that disease is, is not really possible. We'd be sat on the fence a lot of the time. So we need the CT, MR or other um, ultrasound input to be able to diagnose that fully. But the same is then conversely true for CT. You get the anatomical data. And again, because a lot of the time what we're seeing, just as an example on bone scans, we can actually pick up the changes there very, very early, but you need up to 50% change within bone density and bone um, remodeling to be able to see that within any other standard X-ray imaging, whether that's CT, plain film X-ray, or even with MRI, okay? So we need them all is the honest truth. Okay. Um, Terry Smith wants to know, after the injection of the isotope, why does it take 30 minutes before the scan, the scan can start when looking at the heart? Maybe he's had it done. Okay, yes, <laughs> quite possibly. <laughs> so the honest answer for these, it does. we actually have a delay sometimes with all the imaging. It does depend what you're looking at, what's going on. So if we're actually doing a gastric emptying study, for example, where we're looking at how the stomach's working and if there's any problems there that you might have reflux um, or some of the other problems with the ileum, then you would do that straight away. They literally swallow down the radioactivity and you monitor it and you review it. The reality is we are really dependent on how the body is working. So physiology of the body, like we had with that early scan where we saw the circulation from one arm to the other and they counted the time, the body takes so long to work. So when you've got a bone scan, for example, the turnover there is at roughly about, um, when we're doing the injections, three to four hours. So you'll have the injection in the morning, you wouldn't potentially then have the actual scan until the afternoon. So it's the body's mechanisms that it's doing how it works that we're actually relying on. So the circulation within the body here is the critical thing for the heart scan, that even though the blood is circulating around the body all the time, for it to actually cause deposition of the um, blood with the radioactivity within it, it really is about 30 minutes to make sure we've got it particularly within that area. And some of the time we also have problems that even waiting that period of time, it can also dissipate into the um, duodenum and things as well on those patients. And that overlies the heart and the myocardium we're looking at. So we might actually have to get them up and get them walking around, get them to take a hot drink and that type of thing as well. So it's, mm. the simple answer is we're waiting on the body. It's the body's time to do whatever mechanism we're trying to review. That's how long we need to wait. Uh, Alan Pickwick wants to know how much one costs just in case he can buy one. <laughs> it's more than um, welcome to, to go and try that. They, they vary in cost depending on what we're actually looking at. So with the standard dual headed gamma camera that we um, showed without any of the extra CT or anything else, they're about £200,000 um, as they're going through. When you look at the system and things that we're showing you at the higher end, like the one they bought in Lancaster, which is still the analog setup, but it's got the diagnostic CT on the back, then you're at about 550,000 pounds. Then when we get to that solid state technology that we're talking about, and um, on the general purpose camera, then you're at about a million pounds. And that new one that I showed you, that's actually coming in um, with those lovely fingers that come in and do that review, you're about one and a half million pounds. 
So depends how much money he's got in his back pocket, but <laughs> you better open pick a bank here. Yeah. <laughs> and so if I compare that with a big MRI scanner, what does that cost? So a standard MRI scanner, if you're looking at a 1.5 Tesla machine, then they're about a million pounds. If you're looking at okay. a three Tesla machine, then you're about one and a half million pounds. So, so they're comparable. Where this yeah. yeah. Um, Alan Pickwick's on again. Uh, has leaving your atom changed anything? I've got to be honest and say I don't know any impact on there that I've seen whatsoever. Um, and that's probably as far as my knowledge goes on that. I just know that it's not really impacted me. That I can't really give any more than that, <laughs> unfortunately. That, that's probably reaching the limit of my uh, knowledge as it stands. Okay. Tell us um, on. Oh, yeah. can, can I pass on a question I picked up on the chat? It's not mine. Yes. yes um, somebody was asking whether this um, uh, monitoring can have any adverse effect on the patient. <laughs> Right. Um, in terms of what we're looking at, obviously, there's always a possibility that you could have a reaction to whatever we're actually injecting into you. So that is the same case for any medical procedure. You could have an anaphylactic reaction. I must be honest and say I've never come across that in all my years of working, but that's probably the first thing to mention. In terms of the actual radioactivity that we're injecting, we're injecting a lot less than we ever did before. So it's getting smaller and smaller. But like with anything, there's always um, some of the stochastic effects and things that can occur. So whenever you're near any radiation, it can actually cause you a problem long term and can potentially lead to cancer. The easiest way I normally say to this one is if we look at the amount of radioactivity we inject in you for a lot of these scans. Again, I take the bone scan as the example here, just for standard general imaging. The amount of activity we inject there um, is really, really small. Um, normally, if I've got feedback, I ask people and say, would they worry about flying across to America if they're going to go and lay on the beach in Florida and have a nice two week holiday? Um, normally, I have to presume in this case, because we're obviously virtual, but normally this, the answer back is no, they don't mind that, especially if I'm paying for them to go. Um, so they'll actually allow you to go through. You get more radiation in the actual aeroplane flying from the UK across to America and back again to go and have your holiday than the actual amount of radioactivity we inject into you for a bone scan. OK, not a lot of people realise that, which is why they, they, there's been some debate. Should we actually have radiation monitors on the um, pilots and on the stewardesses and things? Yes, yeah. And I know that's been debated long and hard, but they're saying, well, no, not really. But the reality is you get more radiation doing that than having these. So the level is really, really low. OK, but there is a potential it can cause cancer like any radiation. But we've got radiation around us all the time. And I come from the southwest. So we had some of the radon and things as well coming from Cornwall. So I'm actually from Devon, so we used to blame the Cornish for that all the time as well. Okay, some, so of, us put it in the, some of us live near Sellafield. So. <laughs> I was um, Bob, trying to I, not mention that, Bob, but yeah, yeah, that, that's got Bob, a fair impact. Just, on. Can I just pass one, one more? I know you're going through the Q&A, but there's one more from the questions and answers that I yes. think might be quite useful, which is from C. Craddock. Is there a role for these machines to be used in monitoring of healthy patients, e.g. everyone gets a scan every few years? It seems to be good at detecting disease before they might otherwise have been observed. So the answer, and uh, we've actually had some of these discussions before, so I think um, we had the, the person before saying they've actually gone down um, at Northwick Park and been used to do a review on some of these scanners. And um, when we actually had St. Mark's move to Northwick Park and combine, they were doing a lot of testing and things on there as well. Good so question. the reality is that they have actually been utilised for that previously. The problem we have is access to these systems for just doing standard um, work. And the argument comes back again of saying, how much do we do in terms of a standard scan with the potential to impart potential cancers there. So the thing we're trying to prevent by doing continual imaging, would we potentially cause that by doing this um, standard review of these patients every single year? So the reality is 
where do we set the age limit to say when should we start scanning? We know we do mammograms on some of the ladies and things that they're going through, reaching a particular age to make sure we can do those if they're asymptomatic, we can pick up disease earlier. The problem is the access to these systems. So nuclear medicine gamma cameras are actually not in every single hospital. They're actually quite limited, but also then it's the case of how do we actually be able to get the numbers through to do that type of imaging um, and monitor them correctly. So yes, there is potentially a space for it. Um, and again, it's quite controversial and things like that gets quite a lot of debate, but whether it's actually justifiable long-term and um, would you actually impart any potential cancers is where the debate sits even now. Okay, so I'm not sure I've answered that fully, but um, probably cause some more debate longer term. So that'd be interesting to have. Um, let me carry on, Suzanne. Uh, Terry Smith's worried about his heart again, uh, Len. Um, okay. How accurate can a scan be when the, the heart in this instance is moving? That's a good one um, as we're coming across on there. So the reality, um, what we're doing is we've got different types of camera to do the imaging. But when we're actually doing these, the amount that the heart is moving, because he's quite right, because we've actually got a moving heart, we're not doing like we do on CT or even an angiogram, where we can actually look at the heart and stop it in a given frame by um, doing the review. So how quick we take the image. With the actual gamma camera side of things, we're actually doing the imaging. It can be as long as 20 minutes. We've brought that down to less than five minutes with some of the latest technology. But I say that technology is not out everywhere. So if you're using a standard anger gamma camera, it could be up to 20 minutes. But the reality is we're still seeing enough to be able to pick up. So we'll see a resolution on those where we're seeing um, a potential lesion of about five millimeters and above. The reality is we're actually looking at the viability of the myocardium when we're doing the nuclear medicine study. We're not seeing exactly where the occluded vessel is. So on that context, because we're looking at a larger muscle, which could actually have deficit of a blood supply and hence you'd be um, dying off, or you've got a situation where the vessel doesn't actually have the capability to extend and allow increased blood flow when you're exercising, which is why we do a rest and a stress scan for nuclear medicine, then the actual area of the muscle is actually quite large. So the constraints on the resolution of the scan is not to the same level that we're looking at even on something like a bone scan. Um, a question on, uh, you've covered a bit of it, but what, do you really see uh, AI making a major contribution? The easy answer to that one is yes. Um, and as I say, we're already starting to do that and it's got twofold. We're actually utilizing AI on the CT side to improve the um, images on there to do a review. But the benefit of that is actually because we're able to do the imaging, we have what we call um, a low dose CT capability on our systems that utilizes the artificial intelligence to do a really, really low CT scan which would normally what we call um, cause a problem with the flux density within the center of the patient. We can now correct for that and we're modeling. So I'm on the, the more chunky side, as you can see, as it's going through, then for somebody like me, we'd normally have to give a higher KV um, CT exposure and more MAS as well with more photons. What we can do now with artificial intelligence is monitor that, reduce it right down and correct for the fact that I'm actually quite large because it knows the, where the fat distribution is and it differs between men and women. So in women, it tends to actually sit um, in different areas and within men and whatever, it, it actually goes across with different organs. So it knows how that actual dissipation of the body masses sits and it will actually correct for that and do it based on the modeling that it's been done from previous patients and the database it's got. That obviously has a benefit for doing nuclear medicine as well, because we've got improved image quality on those at the same time. And then what we're seeing with the latest CZT technology is the capability to model what we're doing on some of those treatment responses and things as well. So like with the lutetium, the, the latest one, and I'm probably gonna to say too much now because some of this is actually work in progress, but what <laughs> we're doing is actually providing some of the lutetium and CERT imaging with what we actually call in um, the GE side of thing with a program called Qthera. And we're mapping that 
to see what size and what SUV values, which is actually a standard uptake value and determines how much and how active the lesions are to see how we could actually amend the treatment accordingly to better target. So we had the discussion earlier about targeting, how do we guard the other tissues and things. This is where AI is now starting to play a part where we could actually try and manage that better and get a better treatment for the patient by less damage to surrounding tissue and trying to target more effectively how we do these treatments. Okay. Thank you, Len. Enough questions. I'll hand back to John for a wrap up. If John is listening. <laughs> Hello, John. John's gone and he's still on mute as well, John. Oh, here it comes. Okay, I'd just like to thank everyone for organising this and especially for, for Len and uh, really thorough answers to those questions. Um, our next event will be on the 11th of February, uh, again a Zoom presentation um, on railway timetabling and why can't we have more trains stopping at Oxenholme? So that's a special Cumbrian uh, slant on that 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 one. Um, so I'd just like to thank everyone, and particularly uh, Len for uh, tonight. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Len. You, John. Thank you, and thanks for the invitation as well. It's very appreciated, and thanks for the engagement of everybody on the uh, the call as well. Okay, I'll end the session. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>